Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring mandalas and yantras. My guest is Dr. Devashish Banerjee, who is the Haridas Chowdhury Professor of Indian Philosophies and Culture at the California Institute for Integral Studies, where he is also chair of the East-West Psychology Department. Dr. Banerjee is the author of about a dozen books ranging in subjects from art history to philosophy to yoga and meditation. He's based in the San Francisco Bay Area, but he is here with me today in Albuquerque. Welcome, Devashish. Thank you, Jeffrey. Pleasure to be with you once again. Likewise. Let's begin with the distinction between a mandala or mandala and a yantra. They uh, are both visual designs used for spiritual and meditative purposes. Yes, in, indeed, indeed, Jeffrey. They're used for uh, both ritual purposes as well as for meditation purposes. Uh, they're visual designs, both coming from the Indic tradition. The mandala is generally used in Buddhism and today much more prominently understood within Tibetan Buddhism or Vajrayana Buddhism, while the yantra is used more properly or prominently in the, within the tantric tradition, the Hindu tantric traditions uh, of uh, the Shakta, Vaishnava, and Shaiva are followers of the goddess of Shiva and Vishnu, uh, those kinds of traditions uh, for similar reasons, for meditation as well as for, uh, for ritual purposes. The difference between the two, the mandala is a circle. The word literally means circle. So these are circular designs, while the yantra uh, is a geometric design uh, based on various combinations of triangles, squares, and sometimes circles as well. Uh, mandala as a, a circle is a more static uh, design, cosmology, cosmo, cosmo, cosmograph, we may say, a cosmological design, uh, picture of the, of the cosmos. While uh, yantra literally means instrument or engine. Uh, and so it's a more dynamic kind of design uh, aimed at transformation of the nature or movement towards some kind of goal. I'm under the impression that mandalas or mandalas have uh, typically have four sides. I hadn't thought of them so much as circular as square. Yeah, the, the origin of the mandala goes back to the Veda and the idea of the Surya mandala. Surya mandala, Surya mandala is really the solar system. So the, the sun as the center of the cosmos has a sphere of influence that operates in orbits. Whatever is within that sphere of influence rotates around it or rather revolves around it. And so that is the notion of the mandala. Uh, in very early Vedic uh, times, uh, and going on till quite a, a good deal later uh, in India, that was replicated in politics through the idea of uh, the uh, the Rajya mandala. Rajya mandala meaning uh, the imperial circle. So there used to be an emperor at the center and little kingdoms that would, in, a, in that sense, rotate around it in this, the sphere of influence. So that's the essence of the mandala. Uh, the fourfold that you're talking about is also related to one of the early ways in which we think about the mandala as a kind of an extension of, uh, of Purusha or, or the divine 
you know, kind of being. Uh, and that, that fourfold extent, that extension is thought of as a fourfold division. Uh, we, you know, in the Purusha Sukta of the Rig Veda, they talk about the castes, for example. Mm-hmm. But the real essence of the caste is a fourfold division into four forms of consciousness in knowledge, power, love, and service or various kinds of activity, skills. So, you know, these, these are different differentiations of uh, expression, mm-hmm. expressive differentiations. I think uh, that is why you're thinking about the fourfold with regard to the mandala. Well, let me go on a little side trip here. Because yeah. Since you've mentioned the caste system and yeah. the, the classical fourfold division, uh, many people think of the caste system in India as associated with the notion of the untouchables. And uh, they're not even part of this fourfold division of classical India. Yeah, they're, they're not. They're outside the fourfold division, as it were. And over time, these kind of ideas become socialized and they take on new kind of dimensions of power, uh, hierarchy and things like that. And so definitely over time and today it has become a rather uh, corrupt understanding of society to think about uh, these castes. But, uh, you know, if you think about it in terms of a differentiation of consciousness, uh, differentiations of uh, expressive capacities, uh, just like Jung talks about the types uh, four, four, he also talks about the mandala, by the way, and, and the fourfold uh, division of types. Uh, I think types of personality or types of expressive capacity uh, is what is being aimed at over here. Whether you think of a, a mandala as being a circle or a square, I think is going to make a big difference if, if you're using it for spiritual purposes for meditation. I like uh, the rainbow yin-yang. It's a circle. It's very that's, clearly... that's a mandala. Yeah. Jung thought that mandalas uh, are all over the world in different cultures as, as forms of circles. Uh, maybe, maybe some of them think of it as squares. I, I think there's a difference of uh, understanding. I always assume the Jungian typology, the four yeah. basic types, thinking, feeling, yeah. intuiting, and sensing, right. that, that you're, you're, it's a fourfold division very clearly. And I think one of Jung's critiques, now that I think about it, with the Western Godhead, the Trinity, is that it's missing the fourth element. That's, he, that's right. He felt that the, the, the fourfold division was crucial. That's right. That's right. In fact, I have a, a student uh, who just completed her PhD who talks about exactly this, the, the fourfold division that Jung introduces. Uh, she talks about the mandala. She's looking at it from the viewpoint of art, uh, going back to the mother goddesses uh, and the Venus of Willendorf, which is one of the earliest mother goddesses, mm-hmm. as a spherical or quasi-spherical form. And she's seeing, she's trying to understand the fourfold division of that, mm-hmm. how that is. And her whole thesis is about how this fourfold division morphs over time with the emergence of individualism. Uh, so, you know, the, the circle or square, it doesn't matter, but it really, what matters is the division, in, in, in the cross that goes through and creates four quadrants or four, uh, you know, sections. Now, I'm reminded of Leonardo da Vinci's famous diagram of, of uh, sort of squaring the circle. That's right. That's absolutely right. The Vitruvian man. Vitruvian man, yes. yes, yes, yes. And, and, and so either way, circle or square, yeah. it, it's a symbol of the self. It is. It is the symbol of the self and four uh, expressive qualities, uh, four fo- forms of consciousness, etc. Uh, and, you know, the, the Veda talks about the four seasons. So there's a temporal and a spatial four-fold division. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's how they see the mandala. Uh, it becomes a meditation diagram uh, from this particular idea. Uh, so that we find very early the notion 
of uh, these four types or these four uh, qu qualities uh, related to four godheads. So you have a central godhead and then an emanation into four godheads uh, that need to be integrated. So um, one of the earliest forms of the mandala in Buddhism, because it, it's really more prominent in Buddhism, is uh, when they're thinking about uh, the stupa, the Buddha's uh, relic mount, as a mandala. And, uh, you know, people walk around it, they circumambulate it, because it's sort of like the sun at the center that is radiating power, and those that go around that uh, mandala are picking up the energy that is in that uh, uh, center. So it sounds from your definitions that yantras and mandalas are almost identical. There's a lot of similarity. I would say the central aim of the mandala is to come to the center of the circle, which is free of the influence, because that's the center. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the creator of the influence. So uh, the Buddha, his first sermon, uh, which is uh, where he teaches the fourfold, the four noble truths, uh, you know, kind of talking about the four again. Mm. And the four noble truths are supposed to lead you to freedom from the various entrapments of, of, of life. Um, it's called Dharma Chakra Pravartana, which means the turning of the center of the circle of law, of the circle of Dharma. Mm. And it, it's even the, the, the use of the term is again in, in terms of the solar mandala. Uh, so he's, showing us a new way by which we can get to the center and be free uh, while everything turns around it. Well, you know, in our previous interview, uh, which will, has probably been released uh, a week or two prior to this one, we talked about the Bhagavad Gita. And we talked about the term dharma. You've just used that same term again, but I think you used it a little differently this time. Yes, quite true, uh, Jeffrey. So dharma, uh, which is really the law that holds things together, uh, is a Vedic term, and it is inflected slightly differently over time depending on who's using it. Uh, particularly around the 5th century BC when, uh, when the Buddha... Uh, was teaching, uh, the idea of dharma that he sees is really a question of oh, you know, that what, whatever we call dharma right now, which is the Vedic way in which society is uh, structured, uh, is not something that he agreed with. So he was looking for another an understanding of dharma. And this understanding of dharma, what would, would be what frees us from the oppression of that kind of idea of dharma. And uh, it leads to, you mentioned the Eightfold Path, which is a dharmic way of living life that does not oppress others, but also brings one to freedom. And that freedom uh, that, that is at the center of the circle is what is aimed at. While with the yantra, you mentioned the yantra, uh, and the similarity between the two. Um, th there are similar ideas, but there's also the idea of transformation, the union of opposites creating creative energy. So that kind of uh, more expressive goal. I sometimes think of the Jewish star as being a yantra. Indeed. So the yantra, I think the center of the yantra is also the point. The same point which is at the center of the circle. But in the yantra, the point splits into two. So they have a whole uh, cosmogenesis mm. of uh, evolution of uh, how the yantra form is made. So it is the one becoming two and the two entering into relation. So if two enter into relation, they form a third. And the, the relations between the three are the first enclosure, which is the triangle. And so they, they create this evolution goes from the point to the two points to the downward pointing triangle, uh, which is called the yoni, 
because there's natural correspondences and this looks like the vagina. So it's le- really the creative, uh, you know, vagina of the cosmos in that sense. And if we invert it, then it's like the mountain. And so we have a shape that is a, a descending triangle and an ascending triangle. When the two merge, uh, you have the union of opposites. Mm-hmm. So this union of opposites with the center, with the with the what's called the point of bindu at the center, uh, becomes the kind of stable, uh, you know, sort of diagram. Uh, of the cosmos as well as of the individual uh, from which creative expression can take place. Let's go in a little more deeply to the idea of the Bindu point. I've heard it mentioned in a variety of contexts and it's often, in my experience, associated with a higher state of consciousness. Indeed, I'd say the Bindu as a point, even geometry, geometrically speaking, uh, it, it is non-dimensional. It does not actually occupy space. Uh, the Bindu is a vanishing point. So in a sense, the Bindu is a portal into another dimension. It's the point at which the other dimension enters into a lower dimension. So entering the bindu, one is free of the dimensional bondage. At the same time, one enters into another dimension, a higher dimension, from which to see and act in this world. I'd also say, I I didn't finish your your question, earlier question, Jeffrey, which was a very interesting one, about the Star of David. Yes. Sometimes also called the Seal of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And so in Islam, in Judaism, and in Tantra, we all, and in several other cultures all over the world, we find this double triangle, the ascending and descending triangles meeting with, with the point. And then you also have the pentagram, which is a variation of this uh, used in magic. Mm-hmm. But I think this is the most simple uh, dynamic engine of opposites. Uh, because why I mean what what they mean by yantra, or this being the basis of uh, the mantra, uh, sorry, of the yantra, is that uh, the descending energies are descending all the time. There's more and more of it to descend. It's as if uh, infinite uh, spirit is infinitely becoming materialized, Mm -hmm. and infinite matter is infinitely becoming spiritualized. So that's the dynamism of that of that design, and I think many cultures have picked up on the sacred quality, and uh, you know even the visual energy that that it uh, imparts. Getting back to our previous interview on the Bhagavad Gita, I am under the impression in in the magnificent scene in which Krishna reveals himself as actually the uh, incarnation of Vishnu. Uh, part of that is is what Arjuna actually witnesses, the uh, ongoing descent of souls into the realm of matter, into incarnation, and vice versa. That, that That's part of the great vision of the Godhead. Yes, in, indeed, Jeffrey. So, as you say, quite correctly, uh, you know, are, are holding forth that is the double triangle. Mm-hmm. And if we, if we convert it into a symbol, a geometric symbol, that's what he's seeing, mm-hmm. the constant descent of, uh, you know, beings and the dematerialization of the spirit and the constant dematerialization of, of matter. It's sort of a God's eye view of the universe. Exactly. And, and, and I gather, in a sense, it's much more dynamic than, than the, the mandala. Yes. So the mandala in that sense is aiming at bringing you to a still point uh, without this so much, because the whole idea is to arrive at a sense of stasis. Uh, and in the mandala, there are different mandalas, uh, particularly in Tibetan Tantra, uh, there are mandalas where you have this notion of, of the fourfold. Uh, so you have, in fact, there's a very famous, one of the early mandalas is a geometric, I mean, a 3D mandala, which is the 
temple of Borobudur mm. in in Java, yes. Indonesia, and and that that is a mandala because we find there that you have an entire mountain carved into six uh, square platforms, mm -hmm. and then three circular platforms on top of that. And uh, a person climbs up uh, and circumambulates each one of these platforms. And as they do that, they encounter uh, as art on the walls uh, various kinds of uh, things. At first, the first layer has to do with karma. Which, which is how we deal with others in the world and what kind of results come to us. The second to uh, maybe the fifth or, uh, or so is about uh, the journey of, of a bodhisattva, uh, a person who goes through life from a very mundane beginning, learning from different masters and ultimately finding that he's nobody other than the Buddha himself. And then the last uh, few uh, circular platforms have to do with images of the Buddha. And these images are also on the sides throughout, uh, you know, these, all these platforms. Uh, you have four images which uh, show the Buddha in four gestures, hand gestures. And they have to do with these four powers that we were talking about uh, of the division of the fourfold. You know, this one to the north, one to the east, one to the south, and one to the west. You know, Amoga Siddhi to the north, Akshobhya to the east, uh, Ratna Sambhava to the south, and Amitava to the west, from which we get the whole idea of the western pure land. Mm. Each one of these is a pure land. They, they, they form their own cosmoses. The western pure land is a land of compassion. That's why it's so important. But these are the four. One is power, Amoga Siddhi, power. Uh, then you have Akshobhya with wisdom. Uh, Ratna, Garbha, Ratna Sambhava has got a wealth and the, the gifts of the earth and uh, Amitava with compassion. So the question is now, as one goes up, one becomes more and more integrated. And at the top, one experiences the unformed center of the Bindu, uh, Vairochana, who's unformed. Interestingly, if the, the Buddha right at the center in that particular mountain hasn't fully been formed. It's an embryonic form. Mm -hmm. And it is really the, the form that uh, integrates all these uh, movements and ultimately all these qualities uh, of the divine. So mandala meditation, here it's a dramatic mandala meditation in performance. But you could do the same thing in your mind. Mm -hmm. Or you could do the same thing with a diagram in front of you. Uh, and, and that's what the mandala meditation tries to do. I think it integrates our differences uh, and brings us to a state of perfect rest. One of the most interesting uses of the mandala that I've uh, become aware of is the Tibetan sand paintings yeah. of, of mandalas, which I guess also on top of everything else that we've discussed, be because the sand paintings are very fragile and uh, easily destroyed, uh, also reflects the impermanence. Absolutely, Jeffrey. In fact, they're ritually destroyed at the end. So it is a, just like all pujas in India, um, it is, it, it, it's temporal. It occupies a certain period of time. Um, it's really a magic act. We were talking about magic mm -hmm. earlier. So mantras are read. This entire act of very deep concentration is carried out by the monks who actually um, pour sand using very fine nozzles mm -hmm. and create these designs. Um, mantras are read out. Uh, so it's an entire ritual. Uh, and at the end of that, a certain power is invoked. It descends. And then uh, the whole thing is wiped out. Mm -hmm. So the, this is, again, the whole idea of the expression and absorption of the cosmos. Uh, pujas are also like that. Pujas are bringing down a certain power 
and the power is supposed to come into you and then the deity is uh, you know emulated in some way uh, that that's called visarjan so this this act of uh, you know it's it's no longer a form that's necessary because its energy has been utilized and has become part of nature and time how would you define puja so puja and yantras are used in pujas as well puja is a ritual yeah. uh, and it's a ritual in which uh, an image is used and there are three kinds of images that are used one is a actual uh, natural representation um, so we may have a statue for example or a painting uh, one is a yantra so that is this geometric diagram because these geometric diagrams each of them represents a god or goddess so this is a, a geometric representation uh, of that same image that you're seeing in statue form and the third is a, a pot so this is the most primitive and earliest form of the same uh, idea of the god or, god or goddess a pot with water in it mm. so often inside at the center of the mandala they'll put a pot uh, with water in it and this goes back way back i'd say to the indus valley mm. because you have seals there uh, that show rituals being offered to goddesses in trees that look like pots mm. so the pot um, you know becomes an emblem for a vessel uh, as as our bodies as a vessel of consciousness and the water is going to receive the energy that is being invoked uh, into the yantra and into the form of the god or goddess and so that sacred uh, you know descent um, is also taking place in the person who's conducting it it's like an exteriorization of an internal process um in and that really is the meaning of the of the puja the use of yantras and mandalas in meditation how does that work yeah so what we talked about in a puja is an exteriorization but the whole thing can be done inside the mind so uh and i also want to add that this is sometimes a form of transmission a form of initiation and transmission uh puja itself uh for, for example we we find many mandalas and yantras in the market today people buy them as works of art mm -hmm. uh but if you own one turn it back turn it around and look at the back sometimes you'll find that there is a little syllable that is painted in the back uh, in red and that syllable is a sign that it it has been initiated mm -hmm. and the initiation of the mandala or of the yantra is done by a some kind of a adept mm -hmm. who really enters into a state of a realization of experience as we were discussing earlier uh with the idea of uh entering into trance and entering into thousand petal lotus so into a higher state of consciousness and then they transmit that into the mandala uh it, using a variety of means sometimes they breathe into it you know just mm -hmm. through breath and it comes to life you know that's called prana pratishta bringing to life mm -hmm. and then they inscribe something in the back a, a sacred syllable because mantra is connected with this whole thing that the sacred syllable of that god or goddess and now this diagram which is living or this image that is living can then be adored and you know offered made offerings to by others and it it has the power to sort of transmit to them so it's a form of transmission from an adept to a novice um so this is one of the uses and even a puja that's exactly what's happening in the puja at first uh if the priest is an adept they transmit their own realized consciousness into the figure 
and then through mantras, through visualizations, and through experience. And then uh, they do the ritual that brings that energy out and absorbs it back into the person, but also spreads it into others who may receive it. Now, about a year ago, I think it's been, uh, we did a wonderful interview on ch the chakras. Yes, yes. And I'm under the impression now as we speak that one might say each of the chakras is also a mandala. It is. Each, each of the chakras is absolutely a mandala. Chakra also means circle, mm -hmm. and it is uh, actually a flower. Uh, and in particularly in Hindu Tantra, the circles are often flowers because they're expressive. Again, we come to the difference between a mandala that is a pure circle and a mandala that is expressing. So it has petals that express different numbers of petals mm -hmm. to each of the chakras. But it's also organized with syllables, with animals, uh, with other kinds of, with colors, with other kinds of objects, and how it's organized, and it can we can we get to the center of it? That's that's where the deity resides, and the organization is integrated around the deity in that form. So we become the mandala. So to go back to your question about what is the difference between a ritual mandala and a meditation mandala. In the meditation mandala, the same thing that an artist would actually do to ritually bring the mandala to life is carried on through visualization inside. You draw or you create the mandala within your own body. So the body becomes the cosmogram. You have parts of the body in which you have to concentrate on specific gods or goddesses or objects or flowers uh, and center them there. And once you've completed the organization of elements, then you are in your body uh, the, 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 the recipient of the energy of, the, of that mandala. Mm -hmm. So that's how it's done. If I recall correctly, at the beginning of our interview, you indicated that mandalas are often associated with the Vajrayana tradition of Buddhism. And you also talked about the tantric tradition in Hinduism, which, where yantras are uh, used. And I know, at least I was taught, that, that there's a lot of overlap between the both of those systems. They're both considered tantric. Yes, quite true. Uh, so Vajrayana uh, is Tantric Buddhism, and it has absorbed uh, the Tantric ideas from Buddhism uh, into its entire system. And the mandalas of Vajrayana are like that. And often in Vajrayana mandalas, another common motif that you come across is a, a, a pair of deities, a, a couple, a male and female deities in sexual union mm -hmm. at the center. It's called Yabyum, mm -hmm. yeah, a father-mother. Uh, and that, in a way, you may say, is their own conceptualization of the ascending and descending triangles, mm -hmm. uh, given an anthropomorphic form. Uh, so I think these ideas uh, take on their own kind of life in different traditions, but it is, uh, in a way, uh, it is it is the same. So there is a, a, a kind of expressive quality there as well. Uh, the, the union of opposites, uh, yielding energy. Uh, we, we find that in Tibetan Tantra as well. Well, I wonder if it's the case, uh, you must have a good handle on this as an art historian. My sense is that a lot of tantric art, well, you could divide it into two groups. Some of it is very geometrical and very abstract and very minimalist. And some of it is just the opposite. It is very elaborate with many different deities and uh, colors and uh, symbols. And uh, it, it gets, the idea seems to be to overpower the mind with, with, with the complexity of it. Yeah, you're quite right, Jeffrey. I think the simpler ones are for very uh, direct meditation, uh, while the very complex ones, uh, they're like the samsara chakra uh, mandala, which is really about life itself. Uh, so there too, the complex ones 
uh, are to be meditated on gradually. They take time. The simpler ones are supposed that so the time is just like with the sand mandala. Even mandala practice is temporal. Mm -hmm. They they uh, you are supposed to carry it out over a certain period of time, doing a certain number of mantra repetitions, certain kinds of uh, rituals, etc. Even mentally, whether mentally or externally. For example, um, in Japanese uh, tantric Buddhism, which is called Shingon. Uh, they have two major kinds of mandalas. Uh, they're called Vajradhatu and Garbhadhatu mandala. And in these mandalas, they're very complex. There are many different designs in them, many deities in them, etc. So the question is, how are you going to contain all this within yourself? If it's simple, you can meditate on it all at once. Mm -hmm. How are you going to look at this complex design? The same thing happens with Hindu complex mandalas as well. So the way the, the practice of this for an initiate is that they'll blindfold you and ask you to throw a flower onto that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's a random process of synchronicity. You, you meditate and you throw a flower and they open your blindfold and the flower will have fallen on a certain deity. That becomes the center of the mandala for you, the beginning point. So you start organizing it in your mind starting from there. So it's going to take time. You start from there. You meditate on that. You do mantras to that, offerings to that. Make that your own. That becomes your tutelary deity. And then that helps you to organize the rest and make the entire mandala for your own, in a sense. Now, the idea of a tutelary deity I find quite interesting. One could think of it as equivalent to a, a spirit guide, although I gather that uh, the, the notion of an, a tutelary deity goes much further. Yes, it is like a spirit guide, Jeff. I think where it goes further is that in tantric ideas, each of us, our souls, so to say, are born from a certain deity. We are ourselves the emanation of certain deities. And so the idea is this, this deity is called Ishta Devata. And the idea is that through means like dropping the flower or things like that, there is a revelation of that deity to us. And this becomes the tutelary deity because that deity is in its essence your own self. That's your own higher being as they use in new age circles. It's your own higher approach to the, the, to, to the totality, to the whole. And so that you've formed a relationship with that to take you to your own realization. I also presume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that in the Vajrayana and the Tantric traditions, uh, one practices visualization exercises so that the, the tutelary deity comes through not as an abstract intuition, but rather as uh, a fully formed being. Absolutely. You're absolutely right, Jeff. It's, um, it's not, not an intuition in that sense, but it is forming a relationship with an actual being. The being uh, reveals itself to you through vision, uh, through various kinds of forms of uh, relationship, uh, including physical touch, uh, all kinds of uh, ways uh, that circumstances of your life are modified or transformed uh, due to the action of the, of the, of the deity. So it, it's really a very complex practice when one uh, gets into it. It's not, uh, it may seem simple and beautiful. You can take a mandala, there are many posters available, put it up on the wall. They're pleasant to look at, but the Vajrayana practice of working with that mandala is more like merging with it, entering into it. Yes, and, and making, firstly, making it come alive for you and not just making the whole thing, but every little detail in it becomes living in you and becomes an energy that uh, you experience in your life, mm -hmm. along with a central deity that is organizing it for you. And you are becoming the mandala yourself in that sense. Now, 
the practices surrounding yantras, I imagine, are a little different. The, the simplest one is, as we discussed, the two triangles. Mm -hmm. Uh, the most complex one is called the Shri Chakra. It's the symbol of C California Institute of Integral Studies. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it cons it's made up of, just like that uh, Borobudur uh, mountain, it has a three-dimensional form as well. It's, a, it's got a 2D image and a 3D image. Many temples carry a 3D uh, form of the Shri Yantra that's worshipped. And uh, it gives you... Um, first three square, uh, you know, sort of uh, enclosures, then three circular enclosures. Uh, the, the second uh, three of them are with petals, different numbers of petals. And then nine triangles of which there are uh, four of the triangles are, uh, you know, kind of, I mean, uh, opposite pairs mm -hmm. uh, ascending and descending. Uh, not entirely matched. They're slightly, it's as if they're approaching each other. Mm -hmm. And the last one is paired with a bindu. So this is the original triangle, the yoni, yoni trikona, mm -hmm. uh, from which the whole thing is generated. It is as if this Bindu Yoni pair is setting into motion these pairs of opposites. I see the first pair of opposite as the individual, the polarities of the individual, and the three larger pairs of triangles to, to be polarities of the cosmos at the levels of matter, life, and mind. And then you have the three triangles and the three circles each oh, the three squares and the three circles, each of these three systems, systems of three, the triangles, the circles, and the squares represent three strata of existence, just like the mountain. So we are traveling up the strata, and we are also traveling at the highest point along these dimensions. So it's very complex. But each one of them has to, has, has got a bija mantra. It has to be, um, you know, intoned and uh, meditated on. And in the external practice, uh, you make offerings to deities connected with each line uh, that you're meditating on. Uh, and these offerings can be offerings of, of incense. Uh, you know, the five elements. Uh, you know, so the, the mantra represents uh, the etheric element, mm -hmm. uh, incense or, or wind. Uh, sometimes they fan it, uh, represents the aerial element. Lamps, oil lamps uh, represent the fiery element. Uh, water, milk, etc. represents the watery element and food of various kinds represents the earthly element. So they can, they'll make flower, or sometimes it's all reduced to flower offerings. Mm -hmm. But with flowers, you think of all these things, and sometimes it's more elaborate, you actually offer all these things. But it's the same thing in the sense that you do it to bring it to life and then absorb it into yourself and become one with, with, with the yantra. It strikes me that mandalas and yantras are in some way analogous to the uh, Kabbalistic tree of life diagram, uh, which is often presented as sort of a map of hyperspace or of inner space. Uh, I, I guess you could view mandalas and yantras the same way. Yes, I, I would. I would agree. Certainly, they're they're what somebody calls cosmograms, mm. maps of uh, of, of uh, cosmic space. Uh, you know, and organized, except for instead of one tree, that's the, the, which is which is the kind of way in which the uh, you know the the Kabbalistic diagram mm -hmm. is made. Uh, this this can be organized in different ways uh, because the whole idea behind the entire Indic tradition is that uh, the the truth is one, but each individual is different. Mm -hmm. So there, each person, you may say, has a slightly different take on reality, and the cosmogram 
is unique for each one of us. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's such a proliferation of these yantras and mandalas uh, that we can, you know, come into personal relationship with. And I would guess that's why uh, psychologists, psychiatrists like Carl Jung feel that working with the mandala is very therapeutic. Indeed, absolutely. Uh, for, with Carl Jung, as you know, his red book uh, has many mandalas mm -hmm. in it. And they, they came from active imagination, from his own practice. Mm -hmm. And he uh, really prescribes that individuals can come to revelations of significant mandalas in their own lives. And that's what he tried to do with some of his patients. Uh, and I think that's that's valid, just like we can talk of a future poetry where the mantra can be generated by individuals, we can talk of a future yantra practice mm -hmm. or mandala practice. Well, Debashish Banerjee, once again, a very informative, uh, inspirational discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. It was a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you. And for those of you watching or listening, Thank you for being with us.